Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on machine learning. Today we start a new section and this is a section called sampling and MCMC. Where MCMC is not a DJ or something, so MCMC like MC Hammer or something, it's a method. So it's Markov Chain Monte Carlo, okay? So if you want to become a DJ, you could call yourself MCMC. That would be really cool, I think. Um, and this is a set of methods, which is in particular popular by people who like probabilities, right? Who want to solve integration and all these kind of things with numerical methods. So they are really practical methods. However, curiously, the probabilists, they are often Bayesian and they like Bayesian methods. Um, however, sampling and MCMC is a super frequentist method. So it's really like really classical statistics and it's not Bayesian at all in a way, okay? However, it's a super tool to solve some of these integrals that you get when you do Bayesian inference. Nonetheless, there's also an interesting link to optimization with these things. So sampling um, can be seen like a randomized algorithm to calculate an integral, for example, or it can be used to calculate integrals. And MCMC is yet another one. And um, as we will see, one can also take the perspective that MCMC is a form of optimization, which is a really interesting link, I think. Anyway, so let's get started. So what is sampling? Here, by the, by the way, I'm following the really nice book of David Mackay, which is also linked in the literature on the earlier slides. So that's a free book that is that you can download as a PDF or you can buy it for little money. And he, the, the late David Mackay, so he died unfortunately way too early on cancer a couple of years ago. So he wrote really nice, nice book, a couple of nice books, which are all worth reading and which are typically available as PDF. So he was a great researcher doing lots of inter interesting stuff on Cambridge University. And he was very Bayesian, yeah? So if you really want to learn it, this stuff, then you should look into his book. So he really knows what he's talking about. Of course, he's also criticizing in his book sometimes like classical statistic methods. So if you know what a p-value is and you find it cumbersome to understand, also do read his chapter on the p-value. He explains it and then he explains why he doesn't like it, okay? And of course, you have to make up your own mind. And all these methods, they have their merits in some sense, but some things are harder to understand and maybe they answer a dif different question. So it's very interesting to hear his, his take on, on these kind of topics. Anyway, so he really knows this, this stuff very well. So we are following him now in chapter 29 of his book on sampling, okay? So if you want to get more details, then you can have a look there. So also my examples and quotes, they are, they are coming from him. Um, I implemented some of the stuff to produce nice plots and all of this. So that's stuff that I now put in a nice notebook that you can then use where you can also try these methods. Okay, first definition, Monte Carlo method. So Monte Carlo is really the casino in Monte Carlo. So it's, it's not a name of a person or something. So it's really about the casino in Monte Carlo where randomness plays a big role. And so Monte Carlo methods are computational techniques that make use of random numbers. And since in a casino, you have lots of random numbers. That's why these methods are called Monte Carlo, okay? So what goals do Monte Carlo methods have? Typically, we have two interesting problems that are related. The first one is how can we generate random samples? And I'm in the wrong room, but I have a yellow Springer book, really thick from Luc Devoir, which is a thick book like, um, so like this one, but this is a different one. This is Divergent Series from uh, Hardy. But there's a big book like this with 500 pages only on random number generation. So there's a lot to say about this topic. So it's not just rand, but like there's a whole theory behind it, how to do it cleverly and how to do it for complicated distributions and so on and so forth. And once you get into it, you see that it's really interesting. However, as a form of computations, it might be come to a surprise that randomness kind of buys you something, right? And we will see today how random numbers can help you solve some tough integrations. So the idea is basically, um, suppose you can generate samples from some PDF and you have some algorithms for that one, then um, you can estimate also integrations with respect to this PDF of some arbitrary function. So suppose you're interested in this integral of phi of x times a density, which is the same as to say, I'm interested in the expected value of phi of x, okay, where x is distributed according to my density, then that integration, which might be super complicated to find an analytic solution, can be replaced by a simple summation, right? As you know, 
this integration sign that is like a, a, a fraktur s so it's like a classical german s so that is the greek letter for s so they're basically the same letter for sum however this is typically used for continuous sums and that is used for discrete sums of course as computer scientists we like a lot um, discrete stuff because we can compute it very simply right so it's very easy and for the analytical stuff we need like um, we need like sim symbolic mathematics toolboxes or something which are typically a bit tougher and they are of course restricted for integrals that we can look up in tables however with numerical methods like just replacing it by summation we can just let the computer generate now random numbers in this case coming from the distribution of p of x and then just evaluate our function we are interested in and get some function values and then average all the results to get an estimate of the expectation. Okay, so the idea of Monte Carlo method, if you want to compute an uh, approximate an integration is you replace the integral sign by a Greek letter, so to get a discrete summation, and then basically your average um, stuff that you get from random numbers. So that's the whole idea. And now in the following, we talk about how to generate samples given some particular PDF, okay? And some of you, some, some of those you might know already, like there's a function rand, which generates random numbers from a uniform distribution. That's typically like the starting point for many of these methods, but then how to get other distributions from it. So doing this kind of approximation has some nice properties, which we want to list and prove on the next slides. So basically this thing is called an estimator because it has like, some data that goes in it so we have some samples from a distribution and then we do a computation with it and that's typically what an estimator is an estimator is a function of some random numbers and so this particular one is just evaluating a given function phi okay at each of these locations and then averaging the result so this thing could be also called the monte carlo estimator and the notation in statistics is often so the value you want to estimate is phi in this case so you put a little hat on top of these numbers that you are interested in, and then that is an estimator for phi. So this hat often means estimator. Now we can ask different questions. So this estimator, for example, is it unbiased? Unbiased in German means erwartungstreu. So an erwartungstreuer Schätzer, that's the same as an unbiased estimator. And that is asking the question, so if we um, plug in random variables into the inputs of my estimator and I uh, take the expectation with respect to these random variables. So what will my estimator kind of on average tell me? And ideally it will tell me the true average, which is in this case written on the other side. Sometimes this average is also abbreviated on the next pages just as a letter phi, okay? So even though phi might be a function of a random variable, we could sometimes also just write E of the expectation of phi, which is then just phi. So that is a good property because it tells us that in principle, we are getting to the right value, like on the long run, okay? Of course, the question is how fast are we getting there? And that is telling us the variance. So the variance of our Monte Carlo estimator um, can be also computed. And just like putting a letter E in front of this expression with random variables, I can also put this letters var, like variance in front of it. And that was defined earlier in one of the lectures to be the expectation of the square distance to the expectation, okay? Maybe let me write out this definition once more. So it was also just something, um, so we defined what this means and we defined what that means. And similarly, we also defined what the variance of something is, okay? Or let's start with the variance of X. And that basically can be defined as an expectation of X minus the expectation of X squared. And this is again something that you need to read very carefully, okay? So first of all, variance of something where there's a random variable appearing. So here's a random variable appearing, okay, great. So and it is defined to be the expectation of some other expression. And now where's the random variable here? The random variable relevant for this E, yeah? It is this X, okay? So that is a random bit in here. However, this X at the, ba at the back that one is bound by the other expectation operator inside. So this thing in here yeah, is a constant, okay? So that is really a constant. And this bit in here is random. 
I'm just stressing that because it helps to understand these kind of expression, what they really mean. So you really should always check what is constant, what is random. So this is a constant, that thing here is random. Of course, when you only look at this expression, then the x is random and the expectation is averaging over it, okay? Okay, anyway, so that is the definition and one can also rewrite it sometimes. So it is also the same as the expectation of x squared, yeah, where the brackets are like this. So this is just some function of x minus the expectation of x squared, but this time the bracket to the outside, okay? So you take the expectation, this value, a constant, and you square it, and you compare the squared value with the expectation of x squared, okay? That's also a formula for the variance, and that's a way to show that this thing is the same as that one, okay? Good, so the variance is also something like the expectation operator. It's just a different expression, okay? So nothing to worry about. Um, and since the phi hat is a function of these random variables, so the, this expression phi hat of x1 to xn is also a random variable in a way, okay? So anyway, and one can show that this is exactly equal to 1 over n and the variance of phi of x, okay? So the x is random, coming from a Gaussian distribution or from whatever, then we apply some function on it, could be linear or nonlinear, and this will change, of course, the variance of the expression, right? Maybe x has a standard deviation of one, okay, and the phi is multiplying it by five, yeah, then basically the variance will also change accordingly, yeah, by five squared, if I'm not mistaken. Good, so far so good. So these two results we will prove on the next page. And again, the difficulty in these proofs is only to figure out which is constant and which is random, okay? And that the notation is sometimes written by someone who knows exactly what they're doing and so they make it super short, okay? I try to put more in, in these um, expressions. So, first of all, um, let's calculate the expectation. So, short form of writing this is just writing the expectation of phi hat, okay? where here there's no random variable visible, but this is of course seen as phi hat of x1 to xn. But often in books or sometimes, and at this point you just see the expectation of phi hat and then you're wondering, so where is the random variable? But these are the random variables here. Great, J let's just plug in the definition of this expectation. So the definition is this finite sum, okay? Then we use the rules of the expectation that we can drag out a constant, and that we can drag it into a summation, and we have the expectation of phi xi. Now the xi, they're all identically distributed, so they all have the same mean, and basically they have the mean, the expectation of phi x, okay? And that one gets a name that is then very suggestively written as phi, okay? So we can replace all of these by phi, um, sum all of those up, okay? And then at the end, um, how many do we have? We have n summons in here and we divide by n, so the result will be phi. So now in a book, sometimes when you see the Monte Carlo estimator and there's something about unbiasedness, possibly they just write down, okay, the expectation of phi hat is equal to phi. That's it, the rest is a simple exercise. And it is simple, but you always have to be careful with the notation. And I'm stressing all of this because now we have a more difficult derivation for the variance, right? So you should be able to understand these steps here. So that would be good, ideally already now. Otherwise, ask a question. Um, because now we're doing the same thing, but a little bit more complicated. And also here are some magic steps. But don't worry, there's another slide where I'm basically telling you all the tricks, okay? And if there are tricks missing, tell me. I put them on the slide, so if there are some insights missing. Okay. Now, here we are using already our succinct notation, which is useful, right? So we are wondering about the squared difference of this random piece here, this phi hat of x1 to xn, and its mean, where we calculated the mean on the previous slide, and we know that it's just phi, okay? And we are interested in the expectation of the squared distance. So that's the variance, great. So let's write this thing out, yeah? We get all these mixed terms and some square terms in here. And here you see already, it's super annoying to write this with a different notation, right? So I could have written it with um, that expression down here, yeah? 
but it would have been a big mess. That's why this notation is really useful. Okay, and next for each of these summons, we need to check which of them is random and which of them is constant. And if there's an expression with a hat, it's random. If there's an expression without a hat, like that one, it's not random, okay? So, however, let's first sort this stuff out. So the expectation goes to each of the summons, okay? So far, so simple. One term is twice in here because of commutativity. And next, we can see that, okay, the expectation of phi hat, we know already that is also phi. So this is minus two phi squared plus phi squared is equal to minus phi squared. So what happens about what happens to the expectation over here? It just disappears because the phi square is a constant. Okay, so you can just drag it out and you have the expectation over one. Okay, so that's how we get to this expression, which is um, by chance exactly going from here to here. Okay, so it's just the same. So the estimator here, the x squared and the expectation minus the expectation squared. So the steps that we just did are already the proof going from here to here. Okay, just written out. Okay, let's continue. Now let's plug in the definition of the phi hat and multiply out the two sums. So each of the, so it's phi hat times phi hat and each of the phi hat is a big summation. So we get a double summation with i and j, okay? So we have n squared terms over which we are averaging here, uh, which are, no, the one divided by n squared is coming each from one, one n, one divided by n is coming from the first phi and the other one divided by m is coming from the second phi. Okay, we just have written it out with indices y and j, great. No changes to the minus phi squared. Okay, next, we are sorting the summation into the terms along the diagonal. So those are the terms along the diagonal, right? Where i is equal to j and all other terms which are not along the diagonal. So where i is not equal to j, okay? So far so good. Um, next, we say that, okay, so the expectation of um, this scalar times summation, I can drag it in, okay? So that's how I drag in the expectation over here. Now, what about the second term? So in the second term, um, basically um, there we need the following rule. Let me switch to the next slide. X1 and XJ are independent for I and J, right? Why are they independent? They're independent given the parameters, of course, when we are Bayesian, but when we are frequentists, we would just say, okay, they're coming from the same distribution. They're independent, IID, and so we have that the expectation of the product of the two is the same as the expectation of the first times the expectation of the second, okay? This can be, this equality can be proven very simply by um, plugging in here the joint distribution of xi and xj and then noting that the joint distribution for independent random variables can be factorized into p of xi and p of xj. And then by resorting the integration, we get both integrals. Great, so far so good. So we can drag the integration in to the first phi and we can drag it in to the other one, okay? Now, the expectation of phi of xi yeah, will be just phi, as is also the expectation of xj, which is also just phi. So we get phi squared, okay? So dragging in the expectation on each of these terms, we get a phi and this will be then just phi of x squared at the end. The rest stays the same, in particular the summation sign. Great, so far so good. So this term does not really depend on i anymore since the expectation of phi of x i squared is the same as the expectation of phi of x squared. And we have n of those in this um, summation so we get a factor of n in front of this, okay? Which will nicely cancel out with the squared at the bottom. So that's how we get to the final term down here. So what about the other one? So for the other one, we have to do some counting. So here is, one phi squared, okay, so that is the minus n squared divided by n squared, okay, so that is coming from the minus phi squared. And then here we have n squared minus n many terms, right? So it's n squared minus the terms on the diagonal. So that's where we get the n minus, uh, n squared minus n. So the n squared minus n squared just disappeared and we get a minus one divided by n, okay? So that's how we get down here, okay? Great. 
So we should get back to our formula for the variance. How do we get back to that one? Okay, let's again plug in for the phi, the expectation of phi, let's write it out. And let's drag out the one divided by n to the front. And then again, we have some expectation of something squared and the square of an expectation, which is just the variance of phi of x, okay? Again, using the trick going from year to year. This calculation is a big mess in a way if you use the wrong notation. It is already messy and kind of difficult written down like this, but if you would have written it even more with more terms for the phi, for example, this, the whole thing gets really very confusing, okay? I hope this is the path. Maybe there's a simpler way to show it. Okay, let's flip back and wonder, so what does it tell us now? So it tells us that the MC estimator decreases linearly in N, okay? So this is a good thing. So there might be an initial variance of phi of X, right? But my estimator, which is trying to calculate really this value phi, right, is going rapidly um, to the true value. So the variance um, going down, meaning that basically the estimate after a thousand samples is better than the estimate after a hundred samples and the estimate after one million samples, even as a smaller variance, okay? Again, think a second about it. So this variance here on the right-hand side is coming from the randomness of the X. The variance on the left-hand side here is coming since we are seeing random amount of data. So they are randomly sampled. So I could be lucky and get like data that is very characteristic for the mean, or I could be unlucky and I get something else. And that's why I have some variation in my estimation. And of course, you could imagine that the more data I see, right, the better. The, the way why this computation kind of worked is because um, our estimate is a summation and the summation is very much compatible with expectation, right? So the, the, the functional form of the estimator is nicely designed in such a way that it's like playing friendly with an expectation operator, okay? Great, so far so good. So here are a couple of notes which, which should help you if you are stuck. If you are stuck going through the derivation and there are some steps missing, tell me, I put them on these notes. Great. So let's continue with sampling, okay? Since um, what we just discussed is um, this MC estimator is for approximating integrals. And that one is working very nicely, has very good properties. However, how do we get the samples? And that will be the rest of the lecture. So sampling sometimes is easy, okay? So let's try to use sampling, yeah? Actually, we are at the end also calculating an integration. Uh, whatever, but let me show you how sampling can estimate the value of pi. You might have seen that already, but um, there's a very nice way to calculate or to get an estimation of pi. And let me show you how to do it. Basically what you do is you have a box, okay, and you draw the unit circle inside, okay, so Let's say the box has, uh, uh, let's say the radius is equal to one. That means that the box has size two, okay? And now to estimate pi, um, I first need to know that there's a relationship between the circle and the box, right? So the area of the, um, of the box is four, okay? So F like fläche, or let's say A like area, is equal to two squared, which is equal to four. So what is the area of the circle? So that is the area of the box. What is the area of the circle? Okay, you all know it. So it's P times R squared, where the R is equal to one. So it's just pi. Okay, so interesting. This thing is approximately 3.1 something. Okay, um, and uh, which kind of makes sense. So it's like the area four, but a little bit smaller but not really very much smaller, but something still larger than three, but um, really smaller than four. So this number really makes sense. Now, what can I do? How can I use this inside now to calculate pi? I can use it as follows. I take darts and throw them at the board, okay? And the the, all the darts then hit the board somewhere, right? So some of them hit outside my box, some of them are hitting inside the box. And let's assume I'm really bad at throwing darts, right? Being really bad means I'm uniformly filling up 
it's a whole board, okay? So basically there will be darts all over the place. Then what I do, I remove all darts from the board which didn't hit the square and then I count all the darts which are inside the square and I count all the darts which are inside the circle, okay? And then the ratio between the darts inside the square divided by, uh, no, the, let me start again, the ratio between the, the number of darts that hit the circle divided by the darts that hit the square is then an estimator for pi divided by 4, okay? So by having this ratio and then multiplying it with 4, I have an estimate of pi, okay, just by throwing darts. So mathematically, um, we could also say a quarter circle, yeah, with radius 1 as area pi quarter, okay, yeah, that's, that's also my, the whole thing, the whole square had area 4, so one quarter of it is area 1, so it still makes sense, and the quarter circle is area pi, pi, uh, pi fourth. Then the uniform PDF, this is our, those are our darts, okay? We can write it nicely using Iverson brackets. So the density of my uniform distribution is just the Iverson bracket between, um, that is like active between zero and one, okay? And um, now suppose I'm randomly sampling two coordinates from a uniform distribution, which corresponds to the position where my dart hits the board. Then I can say, I can express the pi as the expectation of the Iverson bracket where I'm asking whether I'm inside the circle or not. So for these two x1 and x2, those are two coordinates, and I can calculate the distance from the origin with the formula x1 squared plus x2 squared, and I'm asking whether it's smaller than one, which means I'm inside the unit circle, okay? Uh, this can be also written as an integration like that. Okay, and this integral will be estimated using sampling. Yeah, so I replace the integration by a summation and um, sampling here uniformly my pairs. Okay, and then just evaluating these Iverson brackets. Okay, you might wonder, so why is uniformly such a clever way to do it? Because basically now these bounds here that are coming from my Iverson brackets, I can also put in the integration, right? I could say it's the integral from zero to one for x1 and the integral from 0 to 1 for x2 of this function. And another way to write it is to put densities at the back. Okay, and so sampling from this densities over here, yeah, I get an estimate of this function, which is then approximately pi. I have some code for this, and let me show you the code and let's run it really. So here's the code. First of all, I'm, I'm having some big include because I'm always lazy with typing again. So I'm, I'm, I'm defining here some functions and importing all from NumPy. And then I'm using the function rand, which is giving me a random number between zero and one, okay? And now I really spent some time putting it all into later here as well. So maybe you, you like it. Um, I could say I want to have 1000 darts, okay? And I generate like uniformly random data I generate two random vectors, basically two rows, and then I'm calculating whether an X, a column in X is inside or outside. So for this, I'm summing them all up and ask whether they are less than one. And this is basically the Iverson bracket. And I want to have it numerically. I want to now turn the false into zero and I want to turn the, one, uh, the true into one. And until last year, NumPy was doing it automatically if I call, call the mean of this, but it didn't work when I tried it like a couple of days ago. Okay, then I have this vector of ones and zeros and I just take the mean times four. Okay, so that's it. And um, I can also do a scatter plot. So this is the scatter plot here now. Oops. Which is now nicely showing me all the points basically that are smaller. So what I'm plotting here is a scatter plot of um, all my data where the size of a dot is either zero, then it's not shown, yeah, or it's one, then it's shown, okay? And at the end, I can print out pi hat, which is in this case 3.132, which is pretty good. Of course, if I increase it here, yeah, if I would do um, 10,000, then I, I have more of them and my estimate gets much better already, okay? Good, I can also show you um, what we are doing here basically is 
we are calculating the mean, which means we are summing up all these zeros and ones and divide by the number that we looked at. So how does it look after 500? How does it look after 600? How does it look after 700? This can be calculated like in, in a run row by calculating the cumulative summation, okay? So I'm just taking all these zeros and ones and take the, the cum sum, okay, the cumulative summation, and then each of those normalized by the proper number, the number of summons that we had, so I divide by the lint space of this, and then I can plot it, and then you can see how the thing ideally converges against 3.1, but it doesn't, okay, whatever. So let me uh, run it again, so let's see whether it's at least some, ah, okay, so that is a better one. That looks a bit more, more convincing, right? So it's sometimes above it, sometimes below it, and you see how it's getting closer and closer. And something that I haven't done yet, but I wanted to do is also to plot one over N, right? So one over N will kind of tell me the variance and it will give me like a nice band. So let me put it on the board, what I mean by this. So it's missing in the plot yet, so, but I should include it. So basically uh, we have this curve, right, around pi and it's something random. Oh, that is not so nice yet. So let's say I'm going like this and I can have this one over n function, which looks like that. And that would give me basically for each slice, like it would tell me plus one standard deviation and minus one standard deviation, similar to the GPs. And I can also like add two, um, two standard deviations and it gives me also the 95 percentile or something where everything will be. And any curve that I will sample will be in between of these ones, okay? Great, so far so good. So that is our first sampler, our first integration now that we did here. Let's continue um, with another example. Okay, this is a code, it's also in the slide, but um, I think the newer version that works is not in the slide, but in the notebook. Um, in general, sampling is more difficult because sometimes um, we don't want to sample from a uniform distribution, for, but we are given some PDF, P of X, okay, and then it's, quite difficult. It could be even more difficult that our PDF is not even normalized. And the notation in the book from David McKay is that such a PDF gets a star, okay? So there are some PDFs that don't have stars, they are normalized, and then some of them, they are not normalized. So now you wonder, so where are the non unnormalized PDFs? Where do they come from? There's a whole area, Markov random fields, for example, which is a way to define a probability distribution on graphs or on grids. and and they are typically specified in a way that the PDF at the end is not normalized. So you are more talking about interaction between two points, whether they are adjacent, for example, like in icing model or these kind of things, but you're not normalizing it. And even the, the, the so-called normalization constant Z, like Zustandsumme, is unknown. And it's part of the problem that we don't know it. So unnormalized PDFs are quite often um, uh, found, I think it's statistical physics and in these kind of areas. So it can happen that you want to sample from an unnormalized PDF. So sometimes it's also good if your method can do that. And we will now learn about a couple of methods which can sample from any PDF and some of them they even can sample from unnormalized PDFs. Um, so an intuitive way to sample would be, for example, just discretize yeah, the range of x, let's say it's the real numbers, and you uh, discretize it into finite number of regions and you calculate for each of these regions the local probabilities which is like a small integral or some height of the function or something and then you sample from a finite distribution just randomly pick one of the intervals and that's like already a proper way to sample from a pdf it's approximate anyway right so that's a possibility possibility to do and of course the more regions you have the more precise you are however there are a couple of problems with this in higher dimensions, this is not possible anymore because the number of regions grows exponentially with the number of dimensions, okay? So that is a valid way to go, but only in 1D or in 2D, in very small dimensions. The problem in higher dimensions is that um, some regions of a density might be also more important than others. So to put like an exponentially large grid on your high dimensional data set, and having all these probabilities um, might be somewhat difficult to find the really important regions where most of the action happens. So possibly you don't really know where those are because the object is super high dimensional and you don't know where the maximum areas are. 
right? So it could be very difficult to find these areas. And there's another nice analogy from David Mackay's book, um, which is the so-called lake analogy. And let me, before you, I show you the mass, let me show you the nice picture. So this is the lake from David Mackay's book. And it's green because here it's about plankton. So you want to measure the plankton in, in such a sea and you can go around with your book, uh, with, your, with your boat and you do measurements. And your measurements are that you kind of measure the depth at the location where you are and you can measure some plankton concentration and then somehow you can do some computations. And you're going around with your boat on the lake, but you never know whether there's some really deep area that you are missing, right? And that's like a typical problem in optimization. If you don't have a gradient or anything like that, but you just can decide on locations where you evaluate your function and there you can check, it's like going with a boat on a big sea, but you don't know where the deep spots are, okay? So that is the lake analogy. Um, the story here is, so estimate the average plankton concentration in a lake, okay? And let's say the depth of the lake at a certain location is given by some unnormalized PDF, okay? So it is some P star of X, but flip downside, okay? And um, it can be written as a normalized one times the Zustandsumme, times this normalization factor Z, okay? And let's say the plankton concentration yeah, at a certain location is written as phi of x, and now you want to uh, estimate basically the average, where here you need to average um, where the location is basically um, uh, proportional now, uh, oh, it's, it's like sampled from our unnormalized density here, okay? So it could be, um, let's say you're on your lake and here down here you have like a very high plankton, um, uh, plankton concentration and um, in this area here you might have a very low one yeah then this could really mess up your whole estimate because here most of the water here's most of the water and so if, if you would give everyone the same weight or if you even miss some deep spots your estimation could be very wrong okay so the plan as i said is you drive around with your boat and you measure like the depth and the plankton concentration and then you have some some nice formula to do this and the problem, as I already pointed out, is you never know whether you really reach the important points, right? And that's basically the same story as if you're doing optimization. Let's say you're doing deep learning and you're optimizing some function and you're jumping around in space using gradient descent, okay? You never know whether you will really get to the deepest area, whether you're just in a local area where it's looking good, right? So you never know whether there's something more, something better happening. That's the lake analogy, which is very nice because, I mean, it's easy to think of sitting in the boat on a big sea and you don't know how deep it is at the different locations, right? But you can only sample different points. So that's, that's quite nice. So it can be a very tough problem. However, if your PDF yeah, has some nice functional form or something, and if we are very good at integration, sometimes we can use the transformation of variable streaks, okay? And that's one, um, let's recall that there's this formula for transformation of variables. I think we had it already in earlier lectures. Let me briefly repeat it. So basically the story is you are given a PDF for some random variable X and you say, I define a new random variable Y, which is F of X. So you have some invertible function F, which can go back and forth between X and Y. And you just change the values in some non-trivial fashion. Now, of course, the Y will also have a PDF and the question is how we can calculate it. And of course, the PDF will be influenced by the original PDF of the X and properties of the function. And the, relative, uh, the, the relevant uh, property of our function F here is its derivative, okay? And so there's a nice formula, which looks a bit intimidating if you look at it. However, um, when you just Remember this formula down here, everything becomes really simple. So the transformation of variables ensures that integrals with respect to x, yeah, where you have the density p of x, and integrals with respect to y, where you have the density for, for y, that they don't change their values, right? And the integrals are at the end probability statements about events. So this is basically what you need to memorize. So now if you then um, isolate the p of y and put it here on the left hand side. So you need to move the dy to the other side. So that's how you get the dx divided by dy, okay? 
Now, what about this weird thing in here? So the P of X requires an X. However, on the left hand side, we only have a Y. Okay. So for that reason, first, we need to take the inverse of F and map the Y back to the space of X. So that's why we have this expression in here as well. Okay. But it's the density of X. What about the absolute values? That is, if the function f is monotonically increasing, we can ignore it, okay? However, if it's decreasing, then basically you need to take the absolute value because it doesn't matter whether you change the sign or something, okay? Great, so that is a nice formula. And um, here's some most useful example, okay? I think I mentioned that also already earlier in the lecture, but that is quite interesting. So let's consider a particular function f, okay? And this function f will be the cumulative distribution function of a random variable, okay? So you know if there's a PDF, then under certain assumption, we also have a cumulative distribution function, which is basically um, integrating the PDF from minus infinity to a certain location. So that is the usual cumulative distribution function. And now comes the example. Now suppose that the x is distributed according to the density and you transform the samples of x with your cumulative distribution function. You get a new random variable, okay? So let's first think about the area of values that you can get. So the PDF is a positive function, so it's always have positive value. And we know if we integrate everything, we get a one. So f of x will map the whole range of x into the interval between zero and one, okay? First of all, uh, second, also note that the cumulative distribution function is monotonically increasing, okay? So the theorem from the previous page applies. Now, curiously, what you can show, no matter what your initial density P sub X is, the distribution, the PDF of Y will be the uniform distribution, which is somehow a surprising result. So if you take a random variable and transform it with its CDF, then you get a uniform distribution. Um, another way to visualize this result is by making a picture as follows. So let's take a Gaussian distribution, okay? So this is a Gaussian distribution. And um, let's say I'm having lots of samples from that one and I'm transforming it now non-linearly with the cumulative distribution function, okay? So that is my P of X, my PX of X. This is my space X. And the same over here, this is my space X, but this one is now the CDF, so it's F sub X of X. And now if I take these samples, these numbers, and I transform them, then in my axis Y, so if I put them all in here, all these things up and transform them like that, what happens is in this area, I have many points and those points from which I have many, they get like stretched since this function here has like a, a, a very steep slope. Okay, so they are stretched across a longer interval, right? The points in this area where I don't have, where the density is not so large, okay, those points, yeah, they are in this interval and they get concentrated together onto a smaller interval, okay? And as it turns out, if you do it exactly with the CDF, this thing will be uniform. So the PDF along this one, so this is now the PY of Y that I plotted here over there, okay? So that one then is uniformly distributed, okay? So the areas where I have lots of stuff, where the density is high is where also the slope is large, right? Since the slope of this function is exactly the density, right? So where the density is small, the slope of the CDF is small, and so those areas get contracted over here. And the other ones, they get like stretched possibly. Okay, so that is the pictorial reason for this fact here. How can we prove it? So here's the hand wavy proof, as you know. I like to write it out that it looks very mathematical. However, I haven't written out anything about measurability and about more details on whether the density must have certain assumptions. So this is just for intuition. So 
let's try the, uh, the transformation of variables formula for this setup that I just shown you, okay? So that was saying, okay, I have the P of X and I take the inverse of my transformation function, which is now the inverse of the CDF times the absolute value of the derivative of my inverse transformation. First of all, now the inverse CDF is monotonically increasing. Yeah, so that's why I can omit the absolute value. So that's the first step. Second here, I'm using the inverse function theorem. So that's a very nice theorem that you might know from analysis. And it tells you about a function and its derivative if it has an inverse. So if a function has an inverse and both have derivatives, then you can calculate one from the other, okay? And the formula is basically that the derivative of the inverse is one divided by the derivative of the forward function, okay? And that is spelled out here for the distribution function. Again, it looks a bit complicated because you have to plug in the right thing. So actually, you plug in an x, but you only have a y on the left-hand side. So you first need to transform the x into the y, which is no problem since the function can go back and forth. Okay, so let's use the inverse function theorem and replace this um, derivative with one divided by the derivative um, of the forward function. Okay, so far so good. Um, next note that the derivative of the cumulative distribution function, yeah, which is written down here, is just the density. So we can replace this f prime by the p, okay? And then suddenly we get exactly the same expression as in the front and it just cancels out and we find out that the density of y is just one, which is the uniform distribution, okay? So that is the proof why this is true. We can do it the other way around too. And then we can transform the uniform distribution into anything, okay? So let's see. So the forward idea was if my x has a certain distribution, then transforming it with a CDF would turn it into a uniform distribution. However, my CDF can go back and forth. So why not start? So we are given some PDF and it's CDF. Yeah, but we start with the y and then we take the inverse CDF, so the ICDF, and we map the uniform samples and then we get samples from an arbitrary density. Okay, so that's a clever way to do it. And in this thick yellow Springer book that I told you about um, random number generation, that's one of the chapters where they explain it in detail and mathematically more rigorous. By the way, the book is from Luc Devois and it's freely available online somewhere because it's like too old to be reprinted or something. And maybe the number of readers was not super large, yeah. but I, maybe after this lecture, more people want to have it, this book. Anyway, I think it's available on the webpage of Luc Devois. So he's a professor in Canada. I think in, um, oh, I forgot, in Montreal, I think, at saint Gilles, if I'm not mistaken. Good. So here's an example how to use this insight that we can turn a uniform distribution into something else. Um, for example, let's say we want to sample from an exponential distribution, okay? So the exponential distribution, it just looks like the Gaussian distribution but without a square, okay? So it's really simple to memorize. So it's just e to the minus x, okay? And then, okay, divided by lambda, that's a parameter, that's like a variance style parameter, but okay, it has the same unit as the x, so probably the lambda um, the variance must be a function of lambda squared or something for the exponential distribution. You can look it up whether that's true or whether that's wrong. And then there's some normalization in front. However, this looks like a super simple variant of the Gaussian, right? But it's of course different since we don't have a square. So this exponential distribution, for this one, we can calculate the CDF. In order to do that, we need to calculate the integral of the PDF, okay? However, it can be done since E functions are super friendly, yeah, it leads to another expression, which we can just write out as one minus exponential function of minus X divided by lambda, okay? So that is really the integral of this function up to X. Then of course, we can also solve this function here for X. So we would say this expression is equal to Y, solve for X, and this gives us an expression of the inverse CDF, which is just minus lambda logarithm of y. So now what we're doing next is we sample y from a uniform distribution. Those will be numbers between zero and one. Great, for zero and one, 
the logarithm is defined. I mean, for zero, it's not defined, but for all numbers larger than zero. So somehow we should ignore the zero, but it's an, that's an, a zero set. So we don't have to worry about it. And we just take the logarithm of the result and this will transform the uniform samples into samples from an exponential distribution. Okay, so far so simple. Great, let's use this trick now for something more less simple. And let me explain you another way to generate random data. And this time we want to generate um, samples from a Gaussian distribution. You say, oh, I'm just using rand n, right? But the question is, how does rand n do it? I mean, let's say the rand function is given and it's given by some complicated formula with modulo and super large numbers. And let's say that one is given, how can we use it to now write a function for rand n for a Gaussian distribution? And the idea is the following. We sample in 2D polar coordinates and transform them into Cartesian. So that's the whole idea of Box Müller, okay? Where Box and Müller are two statisticians who came up with this idea. Okay, so we are sampling in 2D coordinates. So first we, um, we sample a squared magnitude, which is basically the squared distance from the origin. And one can show that for a Gaussian distribution, yeah, you can show that the squared distance from the origin follows an exponential distribution with, in this case, with parameter two, if we have a standard normal distribution. So on the previous slide, I showed you how to sample from an exponential distribution. Next, we sample an angle or a phase, so some, um, some angle basically, and then we have a polar coordinate of uh, in 2D, right? So we have the angle and we have the squared magnitude, and we can turn those two numbers into two other numbers. And as it turns out, one can show that then x1 and x2 are both Gaussian distributed, okay? And for the proof, it's a bit involved, so we need to use the transformation of variables formula. However, we have to use it in 2D. So everything that we've written down so far was just taking the derivative in 1D, and with 2D, everything is a little bit more messy, okay? So I didn't spell it out on the slide. Anyway, but that's how you would show it. So here's the code. Um, let me show you on the slide first. So I say how many samples I want to have. Then I turn this rand n sample. I turn it just by applying the logarithm in minus two. I turn it into random magnitudes and I'm sampling a random angle from zero to two pi. And then I just use my cosine and phi uh, sine to transform this into Gaussian samples and I can scatter plot it. Let me show you also in the um, other code so here's some code as well. So that is basically the same code. And what I additionally brought here is really samples from a Gaussian distribution using the, the NumPy library functions, RandN, and I, I show it side by side so that you can by eyeballing decide, okay, they really look similar, right? So it's not really, so it could be that everything is concentrated here more than is over here, but it's not. To me, they really look indistinguishable, okay? So the funny thing about the box Müller method is, so what's the point of it? The nice or the funny thing, the, the selling point is that it's super fast. So it's a super fast way to generate lots of random numbers, but you always get two, right? So you cannot ask for one. So when you want to have just one sample, you might also run box Müller, but you get two and you discard one of them, okay? However, typically we are asking rand n of 10,000 or something. And then the box Müller one is like super fast. Great, so far so good. That was the Box Müller one. Let's look at other general methods for sampling. Yeah, so there are many other methods. Um, before we do that, I want to show you how we could sample under some density. Okay, so let me first, I show you a picture what I want, where I want to get. I want to get to something like this. I have a, I'm giving certain density, okay, from which I can sample and I want to sample points under the density. So what does it mean? Here, I really want to sample two coordinates. One coordinate is distributed according to my density distribution, and the other one should just uniformly fill the area below the density, okay? So that means in an area where my PDF is very large, I need to sample points from zero to 0 0.4 uniformly. And basically where I'm um, not so often where my density is smaller, I'm uniformly sampling from zero to 0 0.1, okay? And then I can have a nice scatter plot, yeah, just plotting the X and Y coordinates, 
and I'm getting getting like this nice shape, right? I have my my density, which I can plot as a line, and all my samples under the density, yeah, they are nicely plotted below. Okay, so let's look at the steps how to do this. So to sample below a PDF, we first sample a location on the x-axis according to our p of x. However, we do it with Box Miller or with minus logarithm of something or whatever. And then we uniformly sample a y value between zero and p of x zero. So we take the x zero that we have and we evaluate our PDF. And then this defines us an interval from which we uniformly sample. Yeah. Now going back to the picture. So how do you ensure that then uniformly sampled at these smaller areas here that now not here are too many points concentrated and those ones kind of are stretched out the reason being, since the x is distributed according to this density, yeah, we will sample way more often around the zero than we do around the minus two. And then if we kind of uniformly distribute all these points that we get around the zero, we get this picture basically and they are nicely spread out. And curiously, the fewer points we have at minus two, for example, they are also nicely spread out. But since we sampled from the density of p of x, it's just exactly the right thing to do. Okay, so we get exactly as many points as we should get down here at minus two, so that this thing looks as dense as the area below the maximum value. Okay, so it's just spreading out very nicely. Okay, so far so good. Um, so mathematically written, it could also be say, x is distributed according to the p of x, and then we evaluate, given a certain sample, the density p of x, and that is like the upper bound for the uniform distribution from which we then sample. Or you could also say, this is the distribution that is given x. So here, maybe I should write an x, and here I should write y given x, okay? So the y depends on the random variable x, okay? Um, yeah, we can also write the PDF of y conditioned on x0 and we can write it all out nicely with our notation. So p of y given x0 is our uniform distribution of y divided by p of x0 and this can be written using Iverson brackets and then I can also move the p of x0 over to the other side, okay, to get like the intuitive form. So I have a uniform distribution between 0 and p from x0, okay, so far so good. That's how it looks like. I guess the code is included. Yes, the code is included and you can play around with it. Okay, so let's say I'm um, having 10,000 data points and then the whole thing still looks dense and it still looks like having the same texture. So if you go very far away or if you take off your glasses, you should see something bluish which has the same um, value of bluish all over the place. Okay, great. Down here you see already our next topic and this is not randomly happening that now rejection sampling comes, but what we are doing here is a preparation for rejection sampling, right? Since in this little chapter on sampling below some density, I haven't told you any new trick how to do like sampling for a certain density. So I didn't extend our toolbox to sample from other densities. I just showed you a neat way to visualize these samples that they could be nicely below the density. However, this trick will be now used for rejection sampling. Okay, so here's now the goal to sample from some unnormalized density. Um, of course, it will also apply to normalized densities. However, why do I write unnormalized? Because the method is so general, it work, also works for unnormalized densities. Great, so what's the trick? The trick is now, we find some other density q of x, which doesn't have a star, so it's normalized, and from which we know already how to sample. Okay, so it could be a Gaussian distribution using Box Muller, or it could be a uniform distribution, or whatever. And then I have to make sure that this density somehow majorizes. I'm not sure whether that's an English word, but it's like majorisierung in, in, in German, and it just means, in mathematically, we define it anyway, it majorizes p star, yeah? If there is a constant c, such that c times this real density is always greater than p star of x. So basically, this is a curve above the other no unnormalized curve, okay? And again, I show you already a picture so that you know what I mean. So this is my unnormalized curve, right? Which might not be really 
integrating to one, it could integrate to a thousand or to whatever. However, there's another density, the bluish one, which can be multiplied by a constant C such that it's larger everywhere. Okay. Great. Then what we're doing is we sample now from Q of X as on the previous slide, now in two dimensions. So we want to sample under this curve and then we keep only those samples which are below P star. And also here, I guess to understand this, I show you first the picture. So we now know how to sample under this bluish curve here. Yeah, We just need to be careful that for the uniform distribution, we are not taking the Q of X, but C times Q of X, right? To get the whole interval up to here, okay? And then we have like a value X, which is telling us something on the X axis, and we have a value Y. And now this value Y, we need to check whether it's below or above the red line. And if it's above the red line, we ignore it. And if it's below the red line, we know, okay, this is now nicely like um, uniformly filling up the area below this unnormalized density. And those are samples from these unnormalized densities. So why is it called rejection sampling? Because all these bluish points here that are not below the red line, they are rejected and they are basically ignored. Okay, um, expressed again um, mathematically, keep only those samples that are below P star of X. And below basically means that the Y should be smaller than the P star of X, okay? So here's an example from the next page. So we have an unnormalized PDF. In this case, it's an E function, E to some polynomial, but this polynomial is not like a squared polynomial, like a Gaussian distribution, but it's something more complicated. It's something to the power of four. And of course, I can could calculate the integration of this guy. Actually, I couldn't, but maybe some people can. And so they might be able to calculate the normalization constant. However, I think already for X to the power of four, it's pretty difficult. And so you can't do it so simple. So it might be already a difficult integration. Um, where does this come from? So this could come from a Markov random field specification where you say how the neighbors are interacting. Yeah, And then you get an expression like this, E to this, some polynomial, and you don't care for the normalization constant, right? Because there are methods to sample from it anyway. Good, and we take the Gaussian PDF Q of X. You're all familiar with that one, where in this case, I choose a particular variance. So I choose the variance to be four, and I choose the mean to be one. So how did I choose them? I choose them in such a way, such that it's kind of nicely is at the right location for my red density. And I must admit, I didn't choose it, so David Mackay chose it. So it's from his examples in his book, okay? Then one can show that for C being equal to 17, one can prove that C times this function here is always larger than my P star. And then the steps that I'm doing are I sample an X1 for my Q of X, I sample a coordinate Y for my uniform distribution, where now I'm not only going from zero to Q, but I'm going from zero to C times Q, okay? Since the other guy is not normalized and I must be really at least as high. And then I check whether this sampled value is smaller than my P star. And if yes, then X1 is a sample from P star. Otherwise I need to go back to step one, okay? And a sample again. So you see, if you want to get a sample and the mismatch between Q and P star is really bad, Okay, maybe you have to iterate very often until you hit a point which is really below the other one. Okay, so it can be very bad. Okay, also here's the code for it and we have the code in here as well. And you can run it for different sizes. Or I can also now increase, so it looks like my, my computer got faster last year so I can have larger numbers, ideally. No, no, yeah, and so Basically, it, it nicely visualizes the whole thing and it does uh, the computations. And here's all the code, okay? Great. So there are some problems with rejection sampling when you get into many dimensions, okay? And this will be an exercise on the, on the next sheet that will be published today. So listen. So the problem here is um, in higher dimensions, the area that is bluish and not red at all, gets larger and larger and larger, right? That is related to the fact if you have a three-dimensional orange, yeah, those are the ones that you typically buy on the market, yeah? You have a certain 
stuff that you peel off and this stuff you you rarely use maybe you use it for baking or something yeah but um only parts of it usually you throw it away so you are interested in how much meat how much uh, is it called meat or flesh i don't know what it's called in english so the the, the fruchtfleisch inside the orange how is the relation between the stuff you want to eat and the, the stuff that you peel away and in 3d it's okay so 3d oranges are great however um, when you increase the dimensionality of your space and now you abstract from the orange to being a circle or a sphere in, in higher dimensions and then you can ask the question so what about the margin outside what's the volume in relationship to the inside and so the volume or the hyper volume of the margin is increasing gigantically large when you increase the dimensionality and so when you buy a 10 dimensional orange yeah, almost all the stuff you throw away and you can eat only very little of it okay luckily we are living in 3d so we are we are fine but people living in 10d they probably don't like oranges so much and this basically is a margin okay so this is the stuff that you throw away from your orange right so the bluish part and so you could imagine in higher dimension this increases super fast and one can also mathematically kind of discuss what's happening so for example suppose you have two gaussian oranges or two gaussian distributions in this case in d dimensions okay so both have zero mean and they have certain standard deviations where one is larger than the other okay and the idea of having one larger than the other is that i want to sample from one okay so let's keep this gaussian distribution so typically if i would have another gaussian distribution which have a, has a larger variance it would look like this and that would wouldn't be useful for rejection sampling so that would be like the um let's use the right letters so the q1 has a larger one so that is my p of x and that is my q of x okay so that is not yet fulfilling that it's everything from the other densities below it so i need to multiply it and then i multiply it and the whole thing looks like that and my new function is called c times q of x okay and now i can sample from my q of x and i only keep the values which are below however this margin here that is the stuff you peel off that you reject okay and you throw away and this area gets larger and larger and larger in higher dimensions so we are having these two gaussian distributions where one has a larger variance than the other so for the one with the larger variance there's a constant c such that it will really majorize the other one okay so we can use this and now the question is how much stuff do you throw away and curiously we can calculate it just by dividing um, at the origin so looking at the origin so why is that the case because at the origin um basically i'm um Oh, how was it so that's something that i always thought about so why is that the origin um, ah, okay that's again i need to look it up so let me first tell the story so the constant can be calculated so the optimal one ah okay i'm back so i know it so okay so it's about now how do we get the constant c okay so the constant c i get by calculating here the height at the origin so i'm calculating p of zero and i need to calculate the q of zero which is over here so this is my q of zero and i need to increase that one so basically i need to scale my q of x in such a way that at the origin i'm reaching the p of x okay so i need to divide by the q of zero right so that will change the height of my q of x to one and then i multiply it with p of x and that will change the height of my q of x to the right height okay so that's why i'm evaluating it at the location zero so that is the formula for my constant c such that they are just touching each other okay great okay i reconstructed it if you plug it all in yeah then the e to the minus x squared is e to the minus zero and that will be one so what remains of the p of zero will be just the normalization factor of the gaussian and you have one divided by two pi blah 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 that's now on the top we have the q and at the bottom we have the p so they switch size now this can be rewritten so first of all the two pi's they cancel out 
And um, the, the sigma square cancelled out with a d half over here. So it will turn out to end up with sigma q divided by sigma p to the power of d. So that is the constant c. Okay. And that can be also rewritten like e and then d times logarithm of the ratio. Um, the other curious insight is that c describes also the volume under this function c times q. Okay. So what does that mean? So q of x is normalized. So if you integrate it out, yeah, you get a one. So that means the area under c times q is equal to one times c. Okay. That's why c is the volume under my transformed or my scaled up density. So if I now look at the ratio, I know that the area below this scaled up version is C, yeah, and the area below the one that I'm interested in is one. So I know that my acceptance ratio will be one divided by C because it's the volume of the one I'm interested in divided by the volume of the bigger one. Okay, so that's how I get to one divided by C. And now we see, so this volume here is, um, the, the C is increasing exponentially fast. That means the acceptance ratio should be also going down exponentially fast, which is very, very bad for the rejection method. Okay, so that is the story for rejection sampling. And your task in the exercise will be to implement it and to plot the curves. Okay, so that's it. Great, so far so good. Let's move on to important sampling. Okay, yet another method to sample from a density. Um, again, in this case, we are not only want to sample from a density, what we are interested in the expected value of a phi of x. So we are really, we want to sample from p of x, right? But we are interested now in the expectation of some function. And the key here is that we are using a so-called reweighting solution where the weight is basically telling us something about the importance. So that's why it's called important sampling. So suppose we know how to generate samples from another density Q of X, and then we are basically reweighting the samples that we get to get at the end samples from the P of X or calculating directly the expectation. Okay. So we adjust the importance of the samples from Q so that they act like samples from X. So, and how do we do this? So this is what we want to calculate, the expectation of phi x, where the x is distributed according to p. That's why I'm spelling it out here, because I will express it as an expectation where x is distributed according to q. Okay, so that is the situation where we need these more verbose um, uh, notation for the expectation. So writing this integration out is just the phi of x and the p of x, okay? So I extend this with the Q of X on top and on the bottom and we order the terms. So basically the Q of X DX now disappears since now I'm saying, okay, sample from the Q and the phi of X times the quotient is the stuff that remains. Okay. Now these quotients, they are now called weights. And for each data point or each sample that I get from Q, I can say, okay, it has a certain weight WX1, uh, WXI. And then I'm approximating my integration with respect to P by uh, summation over all samples from Q, where each of the summons is now weighted according to my weight. Okay, so that is important sampling. That's it. I'm just reweighting the samples. So that is basic important sampling. And for that one, one can show that if I do this for n against infinity, I'm converging against the right density under certain conditions, as always. So what are the conditions? Of course, the density Q must have um, must hit all the possible values of P of X. So suppose the density of Q is only giving us positive numbers. So it's a uniform distribution between zero and one. However, my P of X is a Gaussian distribution, then the method won't work, right? So the problem is that I never hit negative numbers and I never hit numbers larger than one. So I cannot reweight them accordingly and get the right estimate. So an assumption of important sampling is here that the range of Q of X is at least as large as the range of P of X. Okay, so that's an important thing. And if those assumptions are all fulfilled, then one can show that the whole thing converges against the true expectation. So why do I write it out like this? Because I need this fact also 
later on on the next page for the so-called self-normalized importance sampling. So what fact do I need? So if I plug in here the function phi x being equal to one, very boring function, it's just a one, yeah, then I get a statement about the weights. So let's plug in a one in here for that one, and I plug in a one over on the other side. <coughs> Excuse me. Then basically I now get a statement how the average of the weights is behaving. And the average of these weights behaves that they converge then against one. Okay. Now this is a statement I need on the next slide. Yeah? And I can get it elegantly from the statement that we written out here. So now let's talk about self-normalized importance sampling. So that is a fancy version of importance sampling. Yeah? And that applies if we also want to sample from an unnormalized density p star. Okay? And my samples are also coming from an unnormalized density, however the method is doing. So suppose I'm having two unnormalized densities, one from which I want to sample and one from which I can get sample. Then there's a so-called self-normalized important samplings that also solve this problem, okay? So here's the solution. First of all, we need some definition and then everything is super simple. So we can define the ratio of the unnormalized PDFs, okay? Fine, they get a star, so those are W star of X, and I plug them in, and they, if I have these numbers, I can also write it like that it's the ratio of the true PDFs, but multiply with the quotient of the normalization constants, which I don't have. Similarly, I can define the W of X, okay, to be the, the, the ratio of the normalized PDFs. And then we see that, interestingly, this expression here, where I take the normalized weights and I divide them by some summation, yeah, we can see that it doesn't matter whether I put a star here or not. Why? Because here I'm talking about quotients, and so the zp divided by zq appears on the top and at the bottom, and it will cancel out. Okay, so that is an insight that it doesn't matter if my weights will have this form or that form, yeah, then everything is great. Yeah, then it doesn't matter whether I take the unnormalized PDF to calculate the weights or whether I use the normalized PDFs. Okay, what can we do with it? Now let's rewrite our estimator here and let's plug in our quotient of weights here, yeah, where we have this weird expression down here. Then the first equality is we can omit these stars, right? That's something we've seen on the previous slide because the constant just vanish. Next, we drag in the summation into the, into the top part here, into the numerator, and we get a quotient, okay? And now this quotient converges for n against infinity. The top piece converges against the thing we want to have, and the bottom average of the weights converges against the one, okay? So the curious thing here is that this shows that also for unnormalized PDFs P and Q, yeah, the importance weighting works if we do this self-normalization. So this thing down here below these unnormalized weights is called self-normalization. And the funny thing is that it's going to one and so we are doing the right thing, okay? So that is self-normalized importance weighting. And again, there's an implementation of it in the notebook that you can play around with, okay? However, here there are not nice plots with samples, but at the end, we just calculate here some estimation. So the output in this case of this importance sampling here is just some single number, right? So it will be just the single number, the expectation of a particular function. So you see the rejection sampling is giving us really samples, whereas the importance sampling thing is just giving us an estimate for um, an integral. Good, also important sampling of course has problems, so there's no, no, no pre-lunch here, so rewriting the expectation with the reweighting, okay, we see the following, that with the variance something really bad can happen, yeah. Um, so we replace the phi of x in our variance formula now with phi of x times p of x divided by q of x. In particular, yeah, if we sample now from the Q, we still have the one divided by N, which is great. However, inside now we have this more complicated expression. And suppose there are some X where the Q of X is really much smaller than the P of X. 
then this number can get gigantically large, okay, because we divide by a, a very small number, okay, in that case, the overall values that we get from this one really start getting a very large variance, okay? And that is just playing to the intuition that, um, so suppose I'm um, using, <clears throat> suppose I'm, I'm using this density to sample from another density, yeah, then there are some areas like here yeah, where my sampling density Q of X, or let's say this is a Q star, okay, this is a P star of X, where basically my Q star of X is very small, which means I very rarely see data down here. However, the P star really wants to see data. So if I never see data here, I do a big mistake. So there will be a very big bias or not, no, there's no bias, but there will be a very big variance on my estimate because of that. So on the long run, everything is fine and everything is unbiased and everything is great. However, the variance increases a lot. And the reason is that now we are, we are replacing the variance of the phi of x with one divided by n with the variance of phi of x times this quotient, okay? And that can get very, very large, okay? So that's the problem with important sampling. Okay, so far so good. So those were most important stuff so far. However, we have five minutes left and so I want to give you a very brief introduction to MCMC because it will be useful for your exercise sheet, okay? But next time, again, we will start with MCMC and I give you many more details and many more proofs. However, I want to briefly show you also Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And for me, the most difficult thing here is to decide whether it's Monte Carlo Markov chain methods or Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And I think that's the reason why it's called MCMC, okay? Anyway, so as I said, Monte Carlo methods are designed to be um, clever ways of calculating integrals. And for that one, we typically generate IID samples, okay? So I already say here last time, so it's like having a time machine, yeah? So there are different ways to do it. So we can transform samples or we can use rejection sampling, important samples. So there are different ways. The key here is IID samples, okay? However, now we talk about Markov chains and Markov chains are a departure from independent identically distributed samples, okay? So now we will generate dependent samples. Curiously, that also works and curiously, it works much better. So the basic idea is that given some sample X, okay, um, let's say the next sample, so the proposal distribution for our next sample depends on where we are currently. Okay, so suppose we have a sample from a Gaussian distribution, let the next sample not be independent of that one, but let it depend on the current sample. Then we basically get a chain of samples where each sample depends on its previous ones. And that one then is called a, Monte, a Markov chain Monte Carlo method in this case, okay? So what is the Markov chain? A bit more mass here maybe. So if I have a sequence of independent variables, then basically my density factorizes like that, right? Into the, um, into the margin distributions of the single variables. If I have a general sequence of random variables, then I don't know anything, right? So this could be the distribution from a Bayesian network or something. So from some complicated structures with dependencies. So what I know is I can rewrite it like using the product rule, right? I could single out an arbitrary variable like X1 and could say, okay, it's P of X1 times P of X2 given X1 times P of X3 given X2 and X1 and so on and so forth until P of X100 given X99, X98, X97 and so on and so forth, all the others, okay? So that's the product rule and that's a general way to factorize a distribution. And as you know, any permutation here of these variables lead to a different factorization, right? And there are as many factorizations as there are fully connected graphs. Okay, in a Markov chain, yeah, we have the case that a single data point only depends on its predecessor. Yeah, so in a way, this um, formulation of a Markov chain now is a special case of using the product rule or viewing it with a Bayesian network. A Markov chain is a it could be written as a Bayesian network, right? Where I'm having x1, x2 x3, 
x4, x5, and those are the only connections. So there are no jumps ahead. So the, the, the whole graph is really um, not fully connected, but it is just a chain, okay? So the, the chain in Markov chain in this case is basically telling us that there's a certain order on the variable, that's the chain part, and the Markov part says that you only depend on the previous one, okay? And written as a graphical model, you immediately see what it means. It means x3 um, and x5 are independent given x4, for example. So there are certain condition independence or the future, yeah, x4 and x5, given the present, so x3, is independent of the past, x1 and x2, okay? So all these statements that you know maybe from Markov chain theory, from the graphical structure here, they follow immediately with our deseparation stuff, okay? And there are no complicated cases like these weird V-structures or something. So this is really the simple stuff from the um, Bayesian networks. Great, okay, so that's the Markov chain. Now, the Metropolis method is one way to generate samples along a Markov chain, okay? And again, what is our goal? We want to generate samples from some unnormalized PDF P star, okay? And we do the following iteration. So, um, suppose we have already one sample, okay? No matter, whatever, how we got it, okay? We sample the next one. It is a, a candidate. Why is it a candidate? Because maybe we accept it, but maybe not. Okay, so it's only a candidate sample and we sample it from a so-called proposal distribution, which depends on my X, um, on my first sample, okay? And in this case now, this distribution must be symmetric. So an example of it would be, for example, a Gaussian distribution, right? Where you sample the X given a certain mean. Then, you know, you can switch the mean and the variable, right? And this thing holds for Gaussian distribution if now this condition here is a mean. Okay, so we sample from a proposal distribution and then we calculate an acceptance ratio, which is basically now looking at the current sample and the new candidate and it's comparing the ratio. So, and it's calculating this ratio here. Ratio is always good for unnormalized ones because then the, the Sushant summe cancels out. And what am I comparing? So suppose now the new candidate is much more likely, yeah, so it has a larger unnormalized density value than the one where I'm currently am. Then basically this ratio is larger than one, and I take the minimum of one and the number that is larger than one, and it, I will say, yes, great, acceptance ratio of one. It will be accepted for sure, okay? It's a better one anyway. The other case is, that suppose like this is only half as probable as the one that I have already, so somehow I'm, I, I had a, such a nice sample already and now I have a candidate which is only half as good, okay? Then the minimum of one and a half will be a half. So my acceptance ratio will be a half. Now, how is it used? So I accept now X prime with probability alpha. So with this probability. So if it's a half, I will throw a coin whether I accept it or not. Or if it's a third, I will sample a uniform random variable between zero and one, and I look whether it's smaller, 0 0.3 or not, okay? So I make a, an, an, a random experiment to decide whether I accept it or not. This is very similar to sampling in rejection sampling below the density, right? However, here, this acceptance ratio thing is computed differently, okay? So in rejection sampling, it was a PDF or C times a PDF. Here it is um, some ratio between two densities. So if I accept it, I set the value, the next one to X prime, otherwise I stay and I repeat the value, okay? Then I say, okay, my old one was good, I just write it out again. So in each of these iteration here, I get a new sample. It's not like in rejection sampling that I really reject it. I always accept the value, but sometimes I keep the old one. So there are some more details here that I will skim over. I think all you need to know is there's also the so-called Metropolis Hastings method, which is an extension of that. And the only thing is all of the stuff that is read over here. Yeah, here the assumption that the Q function is symmetric is dropped, okay? However, then the acceptance ratio needs to be calculated slightly differently. You need to weight it also with the proposal distribution. And that's it, that's the Metropolis Hastings method. Next time, we will also look why does it work. I show you a demo 
and we go a little bit into the mathematics of this. Okay. However, this, what I told you today should be sufficient to solve the question in the exercise sheet. If there's something that we missed, please ask a question yeah, in our chat. Yeah. Great. So for today, we are at the end. Thanks for your extended attention. So we run five minutes over time. Um, I hope you still enjoyed it to learn something about the exercises today. So I think that was very useful. And we see each other again on Monday. Okay, so bye bye.